I did play against Balotelli once and he was playing in the, <laughs> the left of a diamond yeah. for Man City and it was 4-4-2 and like he really didn't fancy it. On, on the coach, on the way up to playing whoever, we're eating ke- bargain buckets. Oh, wow. But guess what? We were winning. The radiators were full blast, oh. right? Their windows were stuck. They I don't think they had windows. Wouldn't open. <laughs> and we're going, right, okay, we know what's going on here. You joined Luton when you were a kid, nine years old. Talk yeah. to me about that journey from joining Luton as a kid to making your first team day, because I'm sure so much happened in them years. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing, really. If I think back to when I started football, you know, nowadays you see kids' teams at the age of four and five. But really, I was sort of, I always loved football, but I wasn't in a team until I was about eight or nine. Um, so in my school, we sort of, the parents created a team and, you know, straight away loved it. Mm-hmm. And within about four or five games, um, there was loot scouts at the game and, and they picked up three of us. Uh, me and my two mates and we went for a six week trial at the age of nine and and I got in unfortunately my two mates didn't get in oh wow um, they were they were good players they just didn't get in and then ever since the age of nine I sort of stayed in it so ever since I started playing football properly like as a nine year old I was literally straight into the Luton system um, and I loved it I really enjoyed it you know it was um, it was great going to play different teams and you could still stay with your sort of Sunday league team as well Obviously, they got to a point when I was about 12, we had to sort of finish with your Sunday league, which, right. which I, I would say I did miss that. I missed my mates um, and I did hit a little bit of a growth. I stopped growing a little bit and I was the smallest player and I wasn't getting game time. But, you know, it sort of all worked itself out. And um, before you know it, I'm, I'm, I'm at Kenilworth Road and I'm signed in forms for the youth team. So it's... It was a great, I, I, you know, I wouldn't have wished to have been anywhere else. I yeah. love my time at Luton. So when you're saying you are, you know, playing Sunday League football and you're that age, were you were you like just really good for a nine-year-old? Like what was it that made you um, get them scouts on you? Believe it or not, I was an absolute whippet striker. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you probably never hate to see me have a shot in a professional game. But um, I was a striker and I loved dribbling and I was fast uh, and... Um, I don't know. There was just something about it, and and, and I, I scored goals. And yeah, obviously, a few of us stuck out at that age. Um, and you know, as as I got older and older, I started getting pulled back into um, midfield. Yeah. Then right back, and then I, that's where I found my slot. And obviously, throughout my career, I was playing a bit midfield as well, right midfield. But um, I think that tends to happen. <laughs> the really, really good players will stay as a striker yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and have a great career, there, and that's where all the money is. And then you sort of slowly come back and, and you find your position. But I, I didn't start playing right back until I sort of got into the reserve team um, for Luton because, you know, we'd always have youth team games on a Saturday and there was always reserve games on a Tuesday and Brian Steen was the manager of that. And there'd always be a few short, you know, injuries for the first team and players that are, you know, whatever, not available. And they'd always pick a few out from the youth team who have been doing well. And, yeah. They sort of said you're playing right back this week. No one said this is what you got to do. This is how you got to do it. Um, and I remember straight away in the game, I was like, "Wow, this is good. Like I'm getting a lot of time on the ball. I can see the whole pitch. Mm-hmm. I can keep the ball. I'm not under so much pressure, and I can deal with it." Um, and straight away, I was like, "I, I love this." Um, and I think at quite a young age, then I, I realised that I could I could probably have a better career as a right back than a, a, a midfielder, where maybe you got to be a bit stronger, a bit more aggressive. Uh, maybe a bit quick, a bit more skillful. Um, so, yeah, sort of fell into place like that as a right back. And, um, you know, I never really looked back. That's quite interesting because I guess sometimes if you're a kid with a dream of of being a striker and scoring goals, it it must be quite yeah. difficult to be maybe not told that you're not good enough to be a striker, but to maybe go, right, I think we'll mould you more to a, you know, a defensive position. Yeah, I mean, obviously that was when I was really young striker. And then throughout the, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, I was a midfielder for Luton. Um, but I, I just, when I got to 16, 17, I had more standout games as a as a right back. Um, so I don't think it was a case of anyone telling me. I think it was just the case of me realising for myself, this is this is where I can get the best of my ability. Um, you know, who, 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 who grows up wanting to be Gary Neville? Let's be honest. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But 
Um, I, I, I do. I, I loved it because, you know, you get so much time on the ball. And believe it or not, like, you, you probably are the player with most time on the ball. You get the ball the most because in them sort of cornerback areas, you know, you're not really under pressure. And it's what you, it's what you then can do with the ball. Um, more in the central areas, you haven't got time. If you're a winger, you need step overs, you need skills and you need real raw speed. Um, so it just sort of worked for me, really. We've obviously been quite a good club at, at developing fullbacks. And in the time I watched you at Luton, we had you on one side, Sol Davis on the other side. And you've seen recently James Justin get into the England squad and Jack Stakes yeah. went on to the Premier League. And we've had just some incredible fullbacks. And I just think for you to develop the way you have, you won young player of the season, what, two two times in a row and get your first yeah. debut. How did that feel for you after maybe all them years of hard work as a, as a nine-year-old to making your professional debut? Uh, amazing, really. Amazing. Um, just a, a lot of hard work went into it. But, you know, I say it was hard work, but I enjoyed it. So it's not hard work. You know, yeah. all them years, you've probably heard of like the volleys gym under the away, away stand where players, there was like head tennis and, and stuff like that. Hours and hours in there, practicing technique, um, games of football, tennis, um, things like that. Um, it just, it gets you better and better and you don't even realise you're working because you enjoy it. Um, people like John Moore, big influence on me um, growing up there. Um, what can I say about John? It, it was, whenever he was around, you always wanted to impress him. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he rarely gave out praise, but when he did, you, you know, you must have been doing something well. So always kept you on your toes. Uh, and then you have the likes of Brian Steen always pushing you as well. So to, to get them awards at such a young age um, was great. But I always, I never took it for granted. I, I remember when we used to play FA Youth Cup games at home at Kenilworth Road. And I always used to think to myself, this could be the only time I ever get to play at Kenilworth Road. So I better make sure I play well. Yeah. Um, you know, and thankfully I went on and I had like four, four first team seasons there. But I, I never took anything for granted. You know, even if you win an, an award or you're doing quite well, just keep your feet on the ground, keep working uh, and keep pushing. I mean, that first year I was in the, at first team, I played like 38, 40 games and I was on £90. I was on the, the third year scholar salary, £90 a week. Oh, wow. But it didn't matter to me because, you know, I was playing football. And I knew if I do well, everything else will follow after that. You know, the club were in administration. They couldn't yeah. sign me. So I think it was not until actually, because Enoch Shawomley was in the same position, not until he scored maybe a hat trick <laughs> later on in the season. They were like, oh, we've just come out of administration <laughs> or we've, we've been great given the green light to sign you two boys now. Maybe because people were looking at yeah. you and thinking, Oh, we'll take him now. Mm -hmm. Cause they were just paying, Luton were just paying for his like train fare pretty much. Oh, wow. his expense. What a place so, um, to be by the way. A great player. Oh, and real. he actually lives in Florida and I, I was living there for a couple of years and I met up with him a few times oh, wow. and he's, he's doing great things over there. He's, he's got a real business head on him into football, um, stuff like that. So he's doing really well. Oh, I love that. Um, let's talk about the team that won the League One title in 2004 to five. This was my first season as a Luton fan. I, I, I did take yeah. a, a few years to get into football, but what a first year yeah. for me to support the club and what a season for you and, and the lads because it, it was just it was just unreal. It, it was incredible. Um, what I would say about the season uh, or that team, like Mike Newell came in um, sort of the season before and it was, we had a steady, steady old season considering there was all things up in the air, no manager, John Gurney, things like that. Yeah. Then the second season, we just hit the ground running from the start. I think we won the first six games. And the thing I liked about Mike Null is like, it wasn't rocket science. It wasn't tactics boards. It wasn't video meetings. It wasn't, it was just, this is what we're going to do for 10 minutes. This is what we're going to do if we go a goal up. Um, he'd let you know if you weren't doing it right. But on top of that, you had people like Kevin Nichols, Steve Howard, Chris Coyne, down the spine of the team, Marlon Beresford, putting you putting you right and making sure you're at it. So, yeah, Mike was great for me because he didn't complicate things. Um, and sometimes footballers want that, sometimes they don't. Um, and on top of that, you had managers on the pitch as well. So it all seemed to work. Everyone, you know, if you look at the 11 players, the predominantly starting 11 players, we all played about 40 games that season. Yeah. Like, no one was injured. Um so it was just it was just great. And for, for that to be my second season in football, so I've sort of gone like 
from that the first season to that, you're thinking, oh, football's quite good, isn't it? Like professional <laughs> yeah. football. Yeah. yeah, I can't wait for the next 10 years. But then obviously it goes up and down like that. But for me, great, great start for me personally to be part of that team. A great, great bunch of lads. And um, it was just a shame that sort of after a couple of years, everyone sort of went off in different directions. Yeah. But that was the unfortunate thing with Luton at the time. Didn't have the money to hold on to these players. Couldn't resist three million pound bids. You know who? Mm -hmm. You know, just couldn't resist it um, because they need to stay alive as well. So it was a great time. Um, but yeah, just really, really, really fond memories of that. You hear so many times in football about how important it is to have a good dressing room and the, the good atmosphere around the training ground. I guess, was that like that? Because you guys, obviously there was all these off-field problems, but it seems like you guys just put that to the back of your mind and was just really tight knit. Yeah, re really it was. Um, there was so much banter going around. I probably couldn't even tell you half the banter <laughs> that went on. <laughs> it would be X-rated. Um, but Kevin Nichols was definitely involved. Um so it was good. And it was good for me, you know, coming through. It was pro it was still quite old school. You know, I think we've passed all that old school stuff now, you know, cleaning the boots and and, yeah. and the way first team players speak speak to youth team and the way they treat them. But, you know, deep down, I loved it because it, it got me ready for first team football. Um, and, you know, you as a youth team player, you wouldn't really want to go in the first team dressing room. You, you're trying to get the boots to clean the boots. You're getting abused in there a little bit. But <laughs> it, it just makes you a little bit stronger. And then once you get into the, you know, into the first team environment, even though I was quite a shy lad, quiet lad, once I was in there, I felt part of it. And if I had, a, if someone had a go at me, Nico or someone, I'd have a go back. You know, I'd give him it back because once I was on the football field, um, nothing else really mattered. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was sort of in the zone. Um and sort of that's always the way I've been away from football. I'm, I'm quite laid back, but um, when I was playing football, I, you know, I was I was on it. It was interesting earlier what you said about Mike Newell and how he was really good for you because I was I was going to ask like how was he as a gaffer? But I guess I've heard so many stories and like Chris Coyne uh, mentioned a few stories about Mike Newell and your nights out. And I think I heard Warren Feeney once say on a podcast about you'd get a KFC every Friday or something. <laughs> I heard that. I heard that. And I was actually, did we? And I was like, yes, we did. Yeah. Yes, we did. On on the coach, on the way up to playing whoever, we're eating bargain buckets. Oh, wow. But guess what? We were winning and it was working. So again, like Mike always was like one of the lads. Um, didn't complicate it for me. Gave me my first opportunity. As soon as he came in, yeah. I think he saw me and saw a few lads in the youth team was like, look, we need to get, get him in because we're in administration, which worked in my favour as well. So he was trusting uh, of me. He, he he was one of the ones that told me when I was going through my first contract, he said, you'll play in the Premier League. Like, I've got no doubt about that. And I was like, oh, wow, really? And at the time, you're sort of thinking, and again, I didn't take that for granted, think I'm going to play in the Premier League because my yeah. boss said it. Um, you just think, oh, oh, wow. Okay, he thinks highly of me. I better make sure I do it week in, week out for him. Um so yeah, and him, him and Brian Steen were a great team together. You know, Steeny would lose his head every now and again, like 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 you can imagine. But um, no, it was fine. It was it was it was a good it was a good combination, and it's just a shame the sort of way it fell apart. Do you think that kind of like management style would work in the current game? Because it's like you said, it is kind of like the old ages of football, and I couldn't imagine yeah. like Liverpool on a Friday night before the Champions League or having like a KFC or something. But no, no. what what can... what is it that made it? I just it's, it's weird how it does just work out like that because nowadays that would be just like sound abnormal to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I can't picture J James Milner having a <laughs> Kentucky fried chicken, pot of beans. But uh, I, 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 think, I think a lot of it to do is to do with the way academies are run now because these kids, they've got analysis, they've got yeah. the food, they've got the strength and conditioning, um, they've got player care, they've got everything. So the, 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 all these academies, category one, category, they've raised the bar. So then all these players coming through now expect that and more when they start hitting youth team, first team. It's like, you can't go from having all that then to, oh, it's old school and we just do it off the cuff. So football is changing. You couldn't do it nowadays, I think, because players need a lot more now. I don't know whether that's good or bad. Yeah. Sometimes like, I, I would... I, I, 
the way I was a, as a player, I would sort of just work it out. Like I, was, I was a right back. I didn't know one need an individual coach to sit down with me two times a week and go through clips and say this, this, this. It was like, hang on, I'll just work it out for myself. Yeah. And when I'm next time I'm in that situation, what will I do? Um, so I think it has its pros and cons. Everyone's different, but. Yeah, definitely no no KFCs or McDonald's um, for, <laughs> now, for these yeah. teams nowadays. <laughs> uh, going into that first season of the championship then, obviously we had that unreal start. We're playing what two of the three relegated teams in the first three. I think we had Leeds and we had Wolves and we beat Palace Incredible. and Southampton. It was just kind of everything that was last season continued into that start in the championship, didn't it? And did Were you guys thinking, wow, we've got an opportunity to maybe push for them playoffs? I do remember Palace... Um, first game of the season roasting hot we we turned up at the ground and it's like 30 degrees and we're in the tightest you know, if you've been in Palace's away change it was tight there's a big bollard in the middle you can't see the managers talking yeah. everyone's like what's going on the radiators were full blast oh. right their windows were stuck they wouldn't, I don't think they had windows wouldn't open <laughs> and we're going right okay we know what's going on here they've got the heating up full blast they're saying they can't turn it off there's cold showers after the game um but we got through, we won that game. You're like, wow. Um, I do remember in that game, uh, one bit of advice Steenie was giving to me before he was like, Andy Johnson, you, you're going to be marking him on corners. Do not, don't worry about the first cross that comes in because he's not alive. He's not looking for that. Yeah. He'll be on the second one, the flick on or the rebound. I was like, yeah, got it. Yeah, sound. Mm-hmm. So then corner comes in and I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to mark him tight. It gets flicked there turn around Andy Johnson taps it in <laughs> so that was for me that was a learning curve yeah. and it, and Steenie's on the side and Mike Noor frothing at the mouth and I'm like yeah I've got it I've got it thankfully we, we went on to win that game but um, that game's funny as well because Curtis Davis took a knock to the head sort of concussed like nowadays he'd be out for like three or four weeks mm-hmm. got up played on come in we're sort of getting undressed we're having a shower whatever he's, he's going what's the score and we were like, we won 2-1. All right, did, did I play well? Yeah, yeah, you played well. All right, brilliant. <laughs> Who scored? Bang. 30 seconds later. I shouldn't be laughing. 30 seconds later. Um, what was the score? Did we win? God, you just had kept no asking, idea. Just kept asking the same questions. And we were all just, um, we were just like, just t- taking the pee really. But nowadays you'd be like, oh, I think yeah, no, you can Obviously the, the, the physio did look at him. Um, but yeah, that's what I remember about them two things specifically. I remember about that game. But crazy, crazy again, game though, weren't it? And a crazy start to the season. Crazy start. I remember Southampton as well. We beat them. Theo Walcott coming on. Everyone's talking yeah. about this Theo Walcott. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he looks fast. He's, he's just down there and he's gliding across the pitch. <laughs> and I thought, it, the ball come across. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a Sol Davis type of crunch and tackle around my butt. The ball's come across by the clock. Um, the clock in where the clock is and um, I thought I better smash him just to let him know I'm only like 19 or 20 he's 16 and I smashed him we went up in the air I think Harry Redknapp was going crazy and um, but you know because they had such a talented team as well but dream start and you're sort of thinking this could be anything here it's an unreal, unreal start to that season and I think one is Luton fans they do look back on I was only 11, 12 years old but I still remember going to Palace away with my dad and um, that Southampton on the Tuesday night, Dean Morgan last minute, like oh, just so many unreal memories of, of that season. Have you got a favourite game you look back on at your time at Luton and you, that just sticks in your head of, yeah, oh. that's that's one I just remember so vividly and loved it. Yeah. Oh man, the Liverpool FA Cup 5-3 oh, yeah. game. I mean, that as soon as you say that, I'm like, wow. You know, I had all my family there. My family come over from Ireland. They're all Liverpool fans. Obviously, some of them are Luton fans. It's a night game. It's on BBC. You're in the tunnel. Steven Gerrard's there. And you're yeah. like, oh, wow. He, he, wow, he's bigger than I thought. <laughs> and all these players. And you're like, okay. And then, before you know it, we're 3-1 up. We're 3-1 up against the European champions. And you're like, wow, this is unreal. And then there's so many different things happening in that game. Alonso scoring from the halfway line, yeah. last minute. And I remember because Marlon Perisford's gone up for a corner, and it was four three to <laughs> to them. It was our corner, and someone's gone to the ref. Ref, how long? He goes as soon as the corner's cleared, it's done. So I'm sort of on the halfway line a little bit. 
I know the ref's about to blow the whistle, but I think Alonso gets the ball and he's going out a shot. And I'm thinking, the ref's going to blow the whistle here, <laughs> but he lets it roll. And I had no energy. I would have cramped. I was trying to get back. I couldn't get back. Um, but uh, Gerard scored a great goal. And I think we just tired. We got tired in the end. You know, we got tired in the end and it was unfortunate, but it was such a, such a, such a great, thing to be a part of yeah. um, as a young player playing in the FA Cup against a Premier League team um, that was probably the biggest game that stands out and there was one other game that we played at Kenilworth Road at the end of the season when we won the league and it's when Ahmed Berkovic scored a goal and I should know this now I, th- I think it was um, Hull City yeah yeah and and honestly, like the noise, mate, like the noise. It, I thought this, this, the 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 roof was going to come off the stadium. Uh, and you know, like I I talk a lot when I talk about Luton, I talk about playing at Kenilworth Road and how I absolutely loved it. Like maybe my favourite ground. I know yeah, I've yeah. played in a lot of big grounds, but maybe my favourite ground to play in because the the atmosphere when you're running up the right hand side from right back and people are almost touching you. Yeah, it's not as great down the other side yeah. on the boxes, but it's great. Like, and, and, it, and it feels like a 12th man, especially when things are going well. It's incredible. Um, I was going to move on to the time when it come for you to leave, to go to Wolves. How did yeah. it feel for you to leave Luton for Wolves? Because obviously you'd been at the club since you were nine years old. Was it yeah. a tough decision to make to move? or How did it feel for you personally? Uh, it felt a little bit um, scary, actually, because yeah. Luton's all I know. You know, I was... I hadn't long moved out of my family house uh, with my mum and my brother. So it's like, oh, you're going into the unknown. You're going into like, I didn't even know where Wolverhampton was. I'll be yeah. honest. I was like, where is Wolverhampton? You know, I, I know Wolverhampton, but yeah. I don't know where it is. Um, and you're sort of thinking, oh, that's good. They're interested. But oh, I'm a bit nervous. I'm a bit scared. What if I'm like, if I go there and I'm not good enough, blah, blah, blah. But then you soon speak to your agent. You're like, no, you know, this is going to be a great move. And unfortunately, like Luton were relegated and yeah. uh, it was just a great opportunity. And, and a big thing for me was Mick McCarthy was the manager. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Ireland connections and things like that. Um, so, yeah, there was a few teams interested that season from the championship. But, but Wolves were always sort of the one that were most, looked like they were most likely to to try and do something. And uh I went, uh, I went up there, and you know, sort of didn't didn't really look back. Really, it was um, it was I, I probably couldn't have chose a better club to go to. If it, I, th- I think you made more appearances for Wolves, didn't you, than you than you did at, at Luton, and you you were there for a long time, and you suffered a lot with them. You you went up to the Premier League. How did that feel for you? Was it a dream of yours to reach the Premier League as a player? And obviously, you were told it as a as a kid at Luton. So, how did that feel yeah. for you when it, when it finally yeah, happened? It, it definitely was a dream, you know, because I remember um, going back to John Moore. We were driving back from the Luton Rugby Club. We would we had just put the youth team out to put the nets up and take them down for the first team. I had a, I was one of the first that was driving at the time, so I had a car. So I'm driving in my maybe it was like a mini metro or something, and I've got John Moore in the passenger seat, and it's like it's a little bit awkward. It's not awkward, but <laughs> yeah. John's going, "All right, son." I was like, "Yeah," he goes, and I, I'm like, I'm almost crushing into cars I'm like I need to drive properly here I feel like I'm on my driving test and he's going um, what's your dream son and I was like what do you mean he goes you've got to have a dream I was like um okay I said to play in the World Cup and to play in the Premier League he goes all right that's your dream so to work towards that so I was like brilliant so that little conversation with him I was like right that, they're my two dreams so yeah. to get to the Premier League that was that was one of my dreams um and it was, yeah, it was a dream come true. Um, I'd waited, not waited so long, but I'd worked towards it. And um, I just remember thinking, we played West Ham at home first game of the season, Premier League. And I was just remember thinking, oh, well, I'm going to be on match of the day tonight. Yeah. You know, your music comes on, old school. Um, so it was a great fit, but I got injured after I'd, I'd done my medial knee ligaments after yeah. about 60 minutes and went off and then sort of missed three, four months then. How was that for you? Because I imagine it's kind of gotten for a player to work so hard towards yeah. that and then to be, because I guess in your head you're thinking if I don't recover quick enough, maybe I'm at the team or will I, Absolutely. you know, but that wasn't the case thankfully, but how did that feel for you? Yeah, it was, it was stuttering because when I went to Wolves, I pretty much played every game, 80 games over the two seasons. 
And that, that season we got promoted, I was player of the season. So people were probably looking at me, expecting a lot. And then you sort of get injured. And then I probably pushed it too much to come back early. I kept having setbacks yeah. coming back too early just because of the way I was and the person I was. And I wanted to get back out there because, um, but then I eventually got back in, um, sort of, I found a slot in midfield, played sort of right midfield. And for the rest of that season, it was like, it was touch and go whether we'd stay up. And I found myself playing sort of right midfield of a five inside a little bit. And it was more, we'd have Matt Jarvis on the left mm -hmm. and, and um, Kevin Doyle up front. They were sort of the outlets to get the goals and the rest of us were there to shore it up. So it was like a lot of nil-nils, one-ones, one-nil wins. But we got the job done. And then thankfully the next season, I played pretty much the whole season at right back. Um, again, so... <clears throat> That's the thing I'd say, like a lot of people sort of said to me, like, you know, it sort of ruined you coming out of right back playing in midfield. But yeah. I was always like just a kid thinking back to when I was under eight, mm -hmm. under nine, under 10. I just wanted to play football and I play it anywhere. Um, I wasn't bothered. So in your time in, with Wolves in, in the Premier League, who do you think was the standout opponent you played? Who was the toughest opponent you remember playing? Oh, uh, I get asked this a lot, actually. Um, and I'd always, there's two players that come to mind, or three players, actually, that come to mind straight away. Uh, Modric. Wow. Because he was sort of playing left midfield. Right. Because a lot of the teams, it, I don't know when this happened, but when, <laughs> when I started at Luton, it was it was 4-4-2 against 4-4-2. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then sort of overnight one year, it just went, we're back threes. We're we're we got mid. We got five in midfield. We got no up, no players up front. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at that stage, Modric was playing sort of left midfield, and but it was impossible to mark because he would just drift off inside midfield. He'd be up where the strikers are, be in the left back area. Yeah. And at times, I found myself with no one to mark. Or then he would, he'd get in these sort of half spaces where he's sort of enticing me out. But then you've got like. Danny Rose or whoever's playing left back overlapping and it's like do I go in there or not so he was a very clever player Gareth Bale as well from mm -hmm. the same team pure out and out pace I, I did have some good battles against him to be fair um, but you just knew what he was going to do he's going to tap it tap it tap it inside and like a big 10 or 15 yard push with the outside of his foot down the line and you give yourself three or four yards and he'll still he still beats you to the ball I was going to say, because um, if you know what he's going to do, in your head, you're probably thinking, oh, how hard can this be? But I guess then when he's doing it and you're like, yeah, well, that is why he's world class. That's why he's going Real Madrid. Yeah, it's just he's, he's a big guy. If you stand next to him, he's like a bloody thoroughbred. Um, <laughs> and it's just the timing of when you're most stepping, stepping, stepping and you're in the air stepping and he knocks it, you've got to plant your feet and then go. Um his timing was really good. Um, and then the other player as well that always stood out for me was Nicholas and Elka because mm -hmm. he would do this thing where he would, he would stand you up. So he's facing you. There's no one around you and he's not doing any trick. He's not moving the ball and he's, he's just body fainting and he's lifting his foot in the air and then he's gone like in a flash. He's gone like power pace gone. Um, I remember he stood me up in a game and it was like inside the box and he just, he was gone, scored. Nick McCarthy was like, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, I, can't, I don't know. I can't. Is there sometimes though you have to just look at it and go, that was just an unreal piece of play by an unreal yeah. player. I what just can need you more do? players around me, <laughs> Nick. I just need, he's on cheat mode. But um, <laughs> no, so, so them three. But then of course there was loads, like Paul Scholes mm -hmm. stands up. Lampard used to make so many, we played, I played midfield against Chelsea. Actually we won 1-0 in this game, but, he would make so many runs into the box, like honestly. <laughs> and he'd not get on the end of anything, but he would keep going and going and going. I don't know how he didn't score that game because he had a few chances, we had a few blocks, but that's typical Frank Lampard. You know, Dave Edwards used to do it for Wolves. He was yeah. like, Wolves is Frank Lampard, making runs in the box like so many times. So he was great. Um, and then you got the likes of Rooney, David yeah. Silva, um, I did play against Balotelli once and he was playing in the, <laughs> the left of a diamond yeah. for Man City and it was 4-4-2 and like he really didn't fancy it. So if, if you're a fullback playing against a diamond, you've got a lot of space anyway if you can get the ball. And um, he wasn't tracking back and it was brilliant for me because <laughs> we won 2-0 and uh, 
he just didn't fancy it. And Mancini's going mental on the side of him. And I'm like, like, Balotelli's just like waving his hands in the air. And I'm like, well, the longer they keep Balotelli on, the Easy better it is. Yeah. So I'm thinking, please don't take him off. Please don't take him off. Um, so for me, great experiences in it. I love chats like this because it sort of reminds you of like all the players you play against. You soon forget. You yeah. soon forget all these games. I mean, um, I'm sure the 11 you could put together of players you played against would, would be well beaters, you know, in, in their yeah, primes. Yeah. And I yeah. always find it really interesting how obviously you look at a player like yourself and you, you played right back for so many seasons in the Premier League with Wolves. But the way you talk about these players at like are elite level, like Modric, who went on yeah. with Real Madrid and Bale, and it's just like them little differences, I guess, as fans, we don't see, but you on the pitch can feel and see and you're playing against it. Yeah, I mean, ultra, they've got to be ultra professional. Look at Modric, probably the same age as me, 37, 38. He's got a new contract at Real Madrid, just won the Champions League. Um, like you can see he lives and breathes football um, day in, day out. And it, it's no coincidence, you know. I, I, yeah, it's 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 scary, really, to think of these. And and you've got to be lucky with injury as well. And yeah, thankfully he is. And you know, I wish. I sometimes think I wish I was still playing now, um, because it's not when you stop playing, you actually feel better. I was coaching for a couple of years in America, and I was joining in in sessions pretty much every day. And I'm like, I didn't even feel this good when I was sort of yeah. towards the end of my time at Wolves. Nowhere near, but I'm, I was sort of getting through games there. Um, but yeah, I suppose you stop and then you, of course, you're going to feel a bit better, aren't you? If you can dip in and dip out of football, it's not like you're like having hammering sessions every day. Yeah, exactly. When you look back at your, just your whole career then, is there a time where, I know you mentioned when you stood in the tunnel at Luton Liverpool, where maybe you're a little bit starstruck yeah. by playing a, a a big player or an elite player at, at that time? Um, yeah, probably that would be Liverpool that yeah. time. But I was starstruck in this tunnel. But um, what, when we were on the pitch, we were playing, we played really well. Yeah. So I wasn't starstruck on the pitch. I was on it. I was ready. Um, again, there was two managers that I would be like, oh, wow. You know, when, when we were playing and you see him in the tunnel, you're like, yeah. it's like, it's like your headmaster at school or someone like that. And it was Alex Ferguson. So Alex Ferguson, of course, you'd see him and you'd be like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or Arsene Wenger. Like, you'd see him you'd be like, oh, my God, there's Arsene Wenger. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say them above even players. Like, when you, when I saw them and they, they'd come out and you think, wow, they're like, these 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 managers probably preparing to play against, can't try and combat us and combat what maybe I'm going to do as a right back or they might be saying... <laughs> Give it to the left wing because the right back's really slow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that nah, is it was it was great. But then, like I'll always say, uh, you know, uh, you'll speak to people that have played in front of like seventy thousand at Old Trafford or played at Wembley, where you play in these games, and a lot of people will say, my mates will be like, ah, oh, do, do you find it weird playing? And, and I'm like, actually no, because all I can see is like the pitch, like yeah. and, and the twenty two players, and I don't really. And I remember he used to come home from games and think, oh, wow, like I didn't even take notice of what was going on up there in the stand or because you're, so, you're sort of so in, in, in the zone yeah. and not until maybe he's finished playing, you start thinking, oh, wow, that was incredible. When you look back at then your your time at Luton, and your time at Wolves, I know you had some spells at some other clubs, but maybe not as long as, well, definitely not as long as your time at Luton and Wolves. Yeah. Are you like kind of happy that your career worked out like that? Because nowadays clubs can have players that are there for a season or two seasons then move on I guess you had a yeah. chance just to get really settled and get to know like Luton fans Wolves fans and yeah I, I always said when I was like fit and I was on top of my game I was like I made a point I'd say to a few of my teammates I, I said I don't want to be one of these players when you go on the Wikipedia page you've got 10, 12, 14, 15 yeah. clubs I want like two maybe three clubs and I really think I could have had that, um, you know, but halfway through my time at Wolves, I had an ankle injury and, it, and that sort of finished me off, really. It was my third season in the Premier League and after that, I was never the same player. But then because I had just signed quite a long contract, I was there sort of for three or four years yeah. and it fizzled out and we had various managers. I couldn't really get going. Uh, and then when you leave Wolves, you're sort of clinging on and you're going to clubs. I went to Denmark for six months mm -hmm. I come back, I went to Ipswich for a bit, went to Charlton, went to Coventry. 
and it's quite a horrible feeling because you know you're better than what you're showing but there's it's impossible to show it because you can't you can't push off you can't bend your ankle you can't you know yeah. it takes a long time to recover so yeah never wanted to be one of them players sort of towards the end of my career it went six months six months six months six months no, none of these players saw the best of me uh, uh clubs saw it at the end um but yeah it was just unfortunate but yeah, I mean, I'm proud to say that I played 150 odd games for Luton and over 200 for Wolves. Let's move on to what's next for you. Um, you've had some coaching experience in America. So what is next yeah. for Kevin Foley? Uh, good question. Um, I went to America, Tampa Bay, Rowdy's ex-teammate, loved it there, assistant. So, because before that, I was just in the Wolves Academy part-time and thinking, oh, I don't know where this is going. Mm -hmm. Got the call, went there, moved the whole family there, three kids. Loved it. Sort of came back because, um, you know, various reasons, family missed home and et cetera. And it was a bit, it was COVID at the time. Um, and thankfully, my friend, ex-teammate, ex Rob Edwards, was the manager of Forest Green. Yeah. So I, I went in there in January till the end of the season and, and just helped out coaching. You know, he had one other coach and he always wanted another coach, but didn't really have the budget. So, it wasn't an official thing. I was just going in for experience for me, him helping me and me helping him. And um, we all know where Rob Edwards has gone now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I had a lot of people calling me up going, Kev, um, you're not going to Watford, are you? <laughs> so I was like, well, not that I know of. But um, no, so he's gone to Watford and uh, I was grateful for my time at um, Forest Green. Uh, and then other than that, I've just, it, it, it's not easy, you know, it's not easy to sort of get into coaching and get within a team. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a lot of it is who you know and if they can trust you and what's your relationship been like with them. So I'll keep plugging away, see see what jobs are out there. I, I really enjoyed the aspect of like working in a first team. Yeah. Um, because I, I feel like I've got a lot of experience to give and a lot of knowledge to give. And now that I've been able to do sessions for two or three years, I feel like I'm, I'm comfortable in doing things like that, watching games back. Um, and it's all, it's something that I never thought, oh, I'd always be a coach, but it's yeah. something that I thought it's just a natural progression. And if you don't like it, then, you know, it's not the end of the world. So far, I, I, I've liked it. And um, we'll just keep doing stuff. You know, I, I do, I do uh, at the moment, I'm doing like around where I live, young academy players or grassroots players that want sessions, you know, mm -hmm. there might be four lads at a time. It might be one lad. It might be a team that want a session that maybe want a bit of structure. Um, so I'm doing that because when I was in, in America, I did, there was a great appetite for like individual coaching right, and yeah. parents want this and they want that. And the way sport is in America is just the next level. Um, the whole college system is based around sport. So now I've come back, I'm actually like, oh, there's, there's a bit of appetite here for like coaches that can do individual stuff. Um, so that, that appeals to me. So I'll keep, keep doing stuff like that, keep busy and, and just see what happens. And, you know, I really enjoy uh, doing these sort of podcasts and speaking, speaking to people about loot and wolves, whatever comes up, yeah, yeah. reminiscing. I, I really like that. Um, I, I have been playing a little bit of golf and, Really, I do need a job because <laughs> I just, I'm getting worse at golf. So I was going to say you're getting too good at golf because you're having so much time no, to practice. <laughs> I'm getting worse. I'm getting worse. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll keep plugging away. You know, I've only been back five or six months. So, yeah. um, you know, the main thing was to get the kids back into school and get them up and running. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely looking out for a, a coaching opportunity sooner rather than later. Are you still in contact with any of the lads from 2005? Obviously, Stephen Robinson's manager up in Scotland now, isn't he? Steve Robinson uh, came across him a few years ago. He's oh, he was at Oldham. They played against Charlton. Um, don't speak to him regularly. Curtis Davis lives around the corner from me, so I see him every now and again. Yeah. Um, Keith Key, I know he's retired. He's doing well now. He's he's working locally. Um, who else? Dean Brill. Actually, I was speaking to today. He's, oh, wow. he's doing. He's coaching at. Um, Tottenham Hotspur in the academy goalkeeper. Uh, God, there's, there's, there'll be there'll be a lot. Kevin Nichols is an agent, so yeah, yeah you know, I, I 
I can't say like I'm because I was so young at the time and they were all a bit older. Yeah. It's sort of the young ones that speak to Leon Barnett as well. We sort of speak and and um but great lads, great lads. Oh mate. Well, this has been a brilliant chat. It's, it's just been great to hear about your time at Luton, your time at Wolves and well whatever's next. Best of luck with it and you never know, maybe see you coaching somewhere very soon. Yeah. You never know, mate. You never know. Hopefully not Watford. Top man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Cheers, mate. Cheers for joining us today. Top man. Top man.